Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Book Trek 2022. <laughs> this is the 2022 version of an event created last year by Vin at Revenant Reads, designed to celebrate Star Trek fiction uh, in all of its profusion. <laughs> and in 2022, we've broken the event into two parts. Uh, the first is dealing with uh, the old, familiar Gene Roddenberry influenced Star Trek of the original series or the movies or The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Star Trek Enterprise. And then in September, we'll deal with New Trek. Uh, which is both the literal stuff that is Alex Kurtzman and J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams made a series of incredibly stupid Star Trek movies set in a Kelvin timeline, so not in the Roddenberry universe. And uh, then Alex Kurtzman was given unfettered control over the Star Trek franchise and has come out with five TV series uh, that fans and enemies refer to as New Trek. We'll be dealing with not only that, but also all the Star Trek that isn't grounded in a film series. Even if it takes place in the time period of the film series. There's plenty of those as well. Uh, so that's September, but we're still, we're still got a couple of days left in, in August. So we're, I'm wrapping up August with uh, the old Roddenberry era. And one of the things that I've always talked about in Star Trek fiction and in Star Trek itself for the Roddenberry era is that time enters into that universe. It's not just endless adventures of the of Jim Kirk and his original crew, or John Luke Picard. Time enters into the universe and starts passing, mainly because the shows became so popular with fans that they got the original cast to keep coming back to reprise those roles. And there's nothing you can do to hide the fact that a 70-year-old DeForest Kelly looks different from a 30-year-old DeForest Kelly. And you have to make it later in Dr. McCoy's life. You have to make it later in all these characters' lives which means you have to give them later lives. So the original five-year voyage of the Starship Enterprise to seek out new life and new civilizations, that is not ongoing. It might be ongoing in a technical sense in the fiction, but that voyage came to an end. Kirk brought his Starship home. We never get to see it on, on film, but it happened. And then he went out again for another five-year voyage, and, and eventually goes into the Admiralty, goes, goes into the, the upper echelons of, of uh, Starfleet and is unhappy there and then comes back to lead the Enterprise again, to lead a refitted Enterprise out on other voyages. Eventually, he is demoted from Admiral back down to Captain. Now, lots of things happen to our characters. They, they go on to have seasoned careers of their own. Spock becomes a Captain. Uh, Sulu becomes a Captain. Uh, and that element is comparatively unexplored in Star Trek fiction. I can count on the fingers of one hand the really good Star Trek novels, or even mediocre Star Trek novels I've read, that have even tried to set themselves in a later period, in a period when Kirk and his crew are no longer young. Uh, when some of their epic adventures, including a lot of the epic adventures that we know from the movies, are long past, they're long gone. Uh, they've, they've meshed together, this core crew, or they've been pulled apart by their separate careers in Starfleet. Uh, and my, my favorite Star Trek author is Diane Carey. Apparently she's an acquired taste. Uh, uh, Vin, for instance, read one of her books and didn't like it. Uh, he also read one of uh, my, my pre-Star Trek success, pre-movie favorite writers, Arsandra Mashek and Mirna Culbreth. He wanted their, run, run of their books either and didn't like it. Uh, but <laughs> nevertheless, Diane Carey is my favorite Star Trek author. And um, she came up with an idea for, to, for setting a massive adventure later in the original crew's life and career. And the idea was an expedition, a civilian expedition, to colonize a far distant world, the Beltaire expedition they're going. So they are taking a gigantic uh, fleet of vessels on a long voyage to an M-class habitable planet that has no inhabitants on it that they can colonize. And they've got a provisional governor who will be governor when he gets there. They've got all sorts of vessels from gigantic Conestoga tro tro uh, wagon ships that are enormous and carrying all sorts of uh, animal embryos, plant stock, uh, it, it, gigantic numbers of civilians, farmers, blacksmiths, metallurgists, anybody that they're going to need, anything that they're going to need, replicator technology, prefabbed housing. You have to have all of that. And there, so there's a vast flotilla of a ragtag of vessels. And at the last minute, Starfleet, the Federation, decides that this, this expedition needs 
a Starfleet escort. It seems like inviting disaster to send civilians with a few local civilian sourced cutters into the back of beyond without it seems like you'd be inviting the death of some of your citizens so Starfleet sort of heavy handedly invites itself to the party <laughs> with with a few uh cutters of their own and the flagship the starship enterprise under captain Kirk. And it's a massive endeavor. It will take months and months and months even to get to Belterre. Then you've got to oversee all of the implementation of the colonists. Then you've got to go all the way back home. It's a big adventure. And Kirk calls in favors, or doesn't need to, and gets his original command crew to join him in shepherding this whole uh, expedition out into space. So, I mean, this book, it's a, it's a novel. It's not canon. If we were to look, and it's not also the Star Trek, uh, the Star Wars extended universe, which used to be, a, 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 every attempt was made to make it a unified extended universe. So that even though it was other people writing Star Trek book, or Star Wars books for things that had never appeared on screen, an attempt was made to make them not contradict each other. No attempt has ever been made to do that with Star Trek. Uh, maybe lately with a few authors who know each other, but for the most part, no. Uh, so it's, it's possible that, that even as long as this adventure takes, you could fit it into the, the future history of these characters as we know it from the movies. Uh, I don't think much, that Diane Carey and her co-writers much cared about doing that. Uh, I, and I loved it. I loved the series. It gives us a totally seasoned core crew, our crew, the original Star Trek crew. But they're not the same as the original Star Trek crew. They're totally seasoned. They've known each other forever. Uh, there's one point. The, the first book, it's a multi-book series. I think it's six books. Uh, and it is, uh, what is it called? Star Trek New Earth is the name of the series. And the first book in the series, which is written by Diane Carey, is uh, Wagon Train to the Stars. And that, Diane Carey is a big Star Trek fan, and Wagon Train to the Stars is a call-out to a, a joking characterization of the original Star Trek series, which Gene Roddenberry joked, and a few of his uh, of his friends and colleagues and show watchers joked that it was essentially Wagon Train to the Stars. Wagon Train being a long running and very successful Western TV show. Uh, Diane Carey thought she would repurpose that and take all elements of mockery right out of it and just have it be the title of the first book in the series. And uh, there's a, a section in here. I won't read you everything about this. I promise. I I, I could read you chapters, sections of this forever. Uh, there's a section in here where Kirk is uh, talking with his command crew. Almost everybody is there. They all have responsibilities in regard to the fleet before they get to the colony. The first book takes place with them trying to get there. And at one point, he reflects on that, letting himself sink into their comfortable presence here, there being all of his friends, all of the crew that we know. Kirk absorbed the support and their presence at their old duty stations despite overwhelming command postings. They had each asked to serve their expedition posts with the Starship's bridge as their headquarters. He knew, though, that each spent a full second watch running their assigned overseer ships. Check off with expedition security, Sulu organizing all the helmsmen and pilots, Uhura on safety and evac, Spock coordinating all the first officers and their respective duties. Like him, this was the place where they could relax from all other pressures. Somehow, being here was better than being in a bunk someplace with a music or a book. Only Scotty was missing, and only because he couldn't run the vast engineering concerns of the expedition from one station. He'd been moving about so much that Sulu had been forced to give him carte blanche on runabout movement, even within the complex, collision-tempting, stacked-and-packed fleet formation. So this, Kirk reflects on the fact of how nice it is to have these people along with him. We, there's no clash of wills, there's no uh, contrast of personalities, and they think basically as one command unit. There's a great, great scene in this book, where the nervous Nelly civilian uh, governor is on the bridge of the Enterprise when something happens. The fleet is having a bit of a problem, and the command crew, Kirk and all the others, see the problem. They're still talking with the governor. They see the problem, and they're coordinating how to fix it with body language, basically, between them. It never comes up. They just fix it without the governor even knowing anything was wrong. But when this novel opens, there is something wrong. They're embarked. They're in deep space. When a, an automated drone attacks one of the Conestoga trailer, trailers and starts to try to cut through its hull, uh, which would, you know, which would 
catastrophically hamstring the mission and maybe result in massive deaths of some of the civilians on board. And the, uh, the drone has souped up phasers. It shouldn't be able to do what it's doing. It shouldn't want to do what it's doing, but it shouldn't be able to do it either. Uh, and they can't figure out a way to shut it down. It becomes known to them right away as the book starts that this is happening. It would be a catastrophe for the exped expedition. And uh, the owner of the droid is the mother of a man named Michael Kilvellan, who is one of the hired gun pilots in the expedition. Uh, and Kilvellan is on the Enterprise Bridge, and Kirk is not happy with him. <laughs> Kirk is in charge of the fleet, and he's not happy with him. This is a big middle-aged Jim Kirk. This is the Jim Kirk from Star Trek Generations. And he's not happy with Michael Kilvenon because he thinks his mother has been tampering with her phasers, which is against expedition rules. She could be thrown in prison for it. Uh, but they have a bigger problem to solve first, which is to get that drone off the hull of the Conestoga and either shut it down or blow it up. And there doesn't seem to be any way to do that. It won't respond to their automated calls. And the only, the only way seems to be to beam over there inside the drone and shut it down from the inside. Uh, and Michael Kilvenin is mind-boggled at this. You've got, they've got seconds left before it cuts through the hull and, and catastrophe ensues. What on earth? You, you can't possibly be thinking, but uh, this is Jim Kirk, and he is thinking that. It's the only way to do it, so it has to be done. Uh, later on in the book, one of the characters in this book says that he had always thought of himself as a risk taker until he met Jim Kirk. But there's a scene that I want to uh, to read you just a bit, a little bit longer, just a bit of this, where he is he has convinced, so to speak, his strong arm Kilvenin into beaming over to that drone ship. Kilvenin actually says it's been 20 years since anyone said no to you, isn't it? Um, Kirk says just tell him to go, let's go, and let's remember it's not a question of clashing personalities here. Your children are involved in this expedition. Lots of civilians are involved. This is bigger than both of us. Let's get this done. Let's work together and get this done. So they're inside the drone. Uh, coming up in front of them was a sizzling, stinking mass of scorched coils and a huge blackened area of bulkhead, the destroyed shield array. Over there, Kilvenon pointed through a web of cables. Jesus, it's red. Raw overload pulsed through the side of the drone, turning the metal itself rosy with energy. A brief shuffle, and Kirk crouched before the phaser torch relays. Same basic components, he assessed quickly. Different arrangement. When I get the spanner in there and interrupt the Sherman Kelly flow, you give it your family's emergency code shutdown. He bared his right arm and shoved the cyclospanner into the gap between the firing linkage and the coil housing. He's putting his arm in there, even though it's firing electricity, uh, because that's the only way he can reach it and shut it down. Kilvenin shielded his face with one hand. This how you got famous? backing people into corners and twisting them until they squeal? Forty seconds, Kirk counted. Are you thinking about your children? The privateer's dark eyes grew clever. If I comply, no charges against my mother? No deal. Intense and uncharitable, Kirk winced hard all the way to his jaw as electrical activity rushed up past his arm, buried to the elbow in the housing. If your mother has been enhancing her phaser capacity, she's going to be held responsible. The expedition is going to make it to Beltair if I have to push it there. I don't hear you squealing. <laughs> a huff of frustration blew through Kilvenin's nostrils. You son of a... E shut down, web GCX, trident obstruct Michael. The cutting torches burped and the whine of harassment suddenly evaporated. Around them, the drone ship stopped its relentless pulsing and went to neutral engines. The hum of the tractor beam faded with a miserable groan. The whine of overload faded immediately. The red metal cooled toward ugly gray. Relieved, Kirk slumped a little. That was close. As soon as Spock confirms the power down, he'll beam us out of this sauna. Instantly, Kilven ex instantly exhausted, Kilvenin let his throb throbbing head drop back against the coolant tubes. You're a bully, Captain Kirk. Feeling his sandy hair going dark with perspiration, his face russet and blotched, Kirk retrieved his burned arm from the housing. His forearm was scorched with a dozen electrical burns. His white-knit sleeve smoldered. The cyclospanner thunked to the crawlway grid. And don't you forget it, he said. <laughs> so Carrie said, Diane Carey has the character say, you're a bully, Captain Kirk. Then she waits to show us what the bully just suffered to get this done. He made someone else do it, but he suffered plenty himself. Then he says, don't you forget it. Quite nice. Quite nice. Uh, um, and they encounter problems. What caused that drone to go, to go rogue is one of those problems. But also another. 
which is a figure that Kirk thought he had sent away uh, to prison. Turns up under a false name on the expedition, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So is he responsible? Is somebody else responsible? There are also aliens involved, especially aliens involved in the target planet, which of course turns out to be far more complex than the expedition thought. It's not just an M-class jewel waiting to be plucked. There, there are people involved all along the way. There are people involved that they know nothing about. Lucky for them that this the most seasoned Starship crew in Starfleet came along, or they'd have been mincemeat. Uh, and gradually, over the course of these trials and tribulations, as the aliens make themselves known and the expedition seems doomed and is trying to get where it's going and encountering one mechanical problem after another, one instance after another of seemingly benign machines attacking the big Conestotica trailers that are designed, that are the lifeblood of the organization. The cutters don't matter as much. Those big square ships have the supplies that the expedition will need. Gradually, over the course of dealing with all of those, even the uh, civilian roustabouts, the people who don't trust Starfleet, and who don't know anything about Jim Kirk other than his reputation, gradually, over the course of time, they all come to realize uh, what Star Trek fans realized right away, which is that he is the greatest starship captain in Star Trek history. <laughs> I say, uh, totally objectively. And at one point, uh, Kilvanen realizes that. When... Uh, Kirk is another mishap has happened, and he has put his shell his ship between that mishap and any danger to the colonists, even though it might destroy his ship. And uh, they, uh, Kilvenin's own crew is trying to get in on the action, and they know that Kilvenin is not happy with Kirk, but they're all watching what Kirk is doing on their behalf. And they say, uh, after raising the alarm, Augustine came back bright eyed and flushed. Midship, what changed your mind, Michael? Kilvenin drew a breath, probably his last and looked at the center screen. There, Enterprise stubbornly held the Conestoga together using tractor beams, trust, hope, and the brazen tenacity of her captain. He did. He's not letting them down. I figure someday he won't let me down either. You can go forever looking for a captain who'll fight for your life like that. <laughs> and most of the original crew gets a moment to shine in this book as well. Nobody reads them better than Diane Carey, in my opinion. And if they don't get a moment to shine, they do in later books in this series. The, I really wish that I had Star Trek New Earth in a big hardcover, all the parts together. Onion skin paper, maybe double column to fit them all. What I wouldn't give for a thing like that. I don't think these were ever connected. The novels, the individual novels are too long. Uh, but Book 6 is a terrific kickoff to this series. It's a terrific series in general, in my opinion. Diane Carey doesn't do all the writing. The, the writing shifts from book to book. Uh, but uh, I had to go back to this. I love reading. I, I love reading this series. I especially love reading this first book, Wagon Train to the Stars. Uh, so I had to go back and share it with you for uh, for Book Trek because in September I won't be able to deal with my original crew. <laughs> uh, well, at any point in their careers, I won't be able to do it, uh, and I probably will pine for that. But we've got a day left, uh, so I'll wrap this up for now, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Book Two. <laughs>